Well, hi everybody, this is Joe, and welcome back to my continuing series on the life and literature of George Eliot. Um, I'm recording this, by the way, in one of my favorite places to go run. So I was hoping to record this video discussion and uh, head off out into the hills somewhere. I've got my running clothes on, but um, it's getting a little late. It may be dark by the time I'm done with this video. I got a bit of a late start. We'll see. Anyway, um, I've gotten to the point where I finished George Eliot's first novel, finally. I've completed Adam Bede, published in 1859 by John Blackwood. And as you can see, uh, I've beaten this book to within an inch of its life. Uh, I've read it slowly, carefully, uh, I've taken a lot of notes, and I've taken the time to read a lot of her letters and journal entries that are online, available online. Um, the stuff that she entered at about the time when, when this was published in 1859 to get an idea of what was going on in her life at this time. So, um, let's start a little bit. Well, well, first let me say that initially, initially my plan was to read th this book section at a time and then just do little mini reviews as I was going, kind of like live blogging and the, the reading, I guess. So, uh, Bad and Beat is divided up into six separate books. And so, I already recorded a video uh, in which I discussed the first book. And it became quickly apparent to me that Adam Beat is not going to be, is not the type of novel that's going to be served well by doing that type of sequential reviewing. Um, uh, I, I did that in the hope that I could keep the videos relatively short. Um, the problem with that, though, is Adam Bede, a novel like this needs to be taken as an integrated whole. It is not, the plot of this book is not episodic. It, 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 it's not this happened, then that happened, then that happened. No, there is a ultimate climax to this book, which occurs in book number five. And a lot of the things that happen in books one through four, you're not going to understand until you get through the whole thing. So I think doing mini reviews is a mistake. Unfortunately, that means that a, a, a full book discussion uh, may be lengthy. Uh, so I need to get that out of the way. That's the type of book that Adam Bede is. The plot is only one of the goals that George Eliot is, is writing this book for. Um, there are moments, the, 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 well, let's just say that the plot is almost incidental to the book. There is an ultimate climax. Um, the book takes place within a span of, I don't know, about a year and a half, let's say. Um, so there is a plot. There is a major conflict in this book, which I will get to. But there are large chunks of this book, of Adam Bede, where nothing's really going on. Uh, book three is basically a birthday party for the town squire, and it's just describing in detail um, how, how different classes react to each other, uh, games, toasts, you know, how people toast each other in great detail, which is, is highly descriptive and very well written and very interesting for that, but not for a plot, uh, not for a plot. It's almost, it's almost as if, uh, I hear a lot of people complain about the book Moby Dick. Yeah, it's got a really cool plot, but there's those long, long chapters, and many of them, in which there's nothing but descriptions of wailing and whales and, and wailing utensils and wailing tools and, you know, almost mini essays. Um, that's kind of the same way Adam Bede is written. Uh, maybe not that descriptive, but nonetheless, it is a book that describes the Midlands of England, uh, the rural, provincial areas of England in around the year 1800 and describing it to an intended audience of, of, of educated Londoners. Let's just put it all that way. So it serves its purpose to describe a world uh, that is unknown to a very literate audience. So with all that said, let's talk a little bit about what was going on in George Eliot's life in, at the time of publication in 1859. So a Based on George Eliot's letters and her journal entries at about this time, it seems that I get the impression that it was a very happy time in George Eliot's life. 
Uh, she is traveling the mainland of Europe at this time. She is no longer caretaking for her father. Her father has since died. Um, and she is in a marriage, in, an illegal marriage, but a marriage in her own eyes to a man that she seems very devoted to, a man named George Lewis, who is also a bit of a uh, uh, intellectual and really served, however, as her uh, literary agent. Uh, George Lewis also published many books uh, in his own life. In 1859, for instance, George Lewis published a book. Pardon me, I gotta take my running glasses off. Um, he published a book called Physiology of Common Life, in which he muses and speculates on uh, the health and fitness of, uh, of humans. Um, <laughs> And I browsed that book, and it is crazy out of date. Uh, there is nothing in it that appears to be accurate at all. For instance, for instance, George Lewis argues in his book that uh, sugar is healthy. It provides energy, true. But many people argue that it is not good for teeth. Sugar degrades teeth. Uh, on the contrary, says George Lewis, sugar doesn't do anything for the teeth. And what is his argument? Well, we all know that black people eat lots of sugar and look at their teeth. They're really healthy. Uh, so with ironclad logic like that, uh, I think that's one reason why the books of George Lewis have long been forgotten. Uh, no, his wife, uh, Marianne Evans, uh, George uh, Eliot. His wife was the one with the true talent, and I think he served basically as his literary agent uh, slash editor uh, for most of his adult life. Uh, so um, they, they, George Eliot and George Lewis did have what was considered a very scandalous marriage, and um, a lot of what you're going to hear about George Eliot is going to revolve around that marriage. I'm not really interested in that type, in that kind of scandal. I may talk about it in another video. Let's just say that um, uh, their marriages were not monogamous. They were, they were, uh, they were mutually, uh, 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 it was an open marriage uh, by agreement, by common agreement amongst them and their friends. And I'll just leave it at that. Um, so George Eliot had no domestic obligations during this time. Um, interestingly, interestingly enough, Adam Bede, the novel Adam Bede, to my knowledge, appears to be the only book written by George Eliot in which the author was intentionally trying to pass herself off as a man named George Eliot. Remember, uh, the three short stories that I reviewed earlier, The Scenes of Clerical Life, were all published by John Blackwood anonymously. Uh, George Eliot was a name that was given later when they were all collected and uh, published together under the title Scenes of Clerical Life. But they were published anonymously. After Adam Bede was published, uh, George Eliot's identity was quickly discovered. Uh, the publisher, John Blackwood, by this time certainly, certainly knew who George Eliot was. Uh, it was uh, the wife of George Lewis named, uh, real name, Marianne Evans. Uh, but every subsequent book that was written after Adam Bede, uh, Mill on the Floss, uh, Romola, uh, Silas Marner, etc., etc., were all published under the name of George Eliot with the understanding that everybody knew who George Eliot was by this time. It's kind of like Elton John. Everybody knows his real name is Reginald Dwight, He's going to continue to call himself Elton John till the day he dies. It's a professional name. And uh, that's in the case with uh, George Eliot. But Adam Bede appears to be the one exception in which uh, the author, George Eliot, was really trying to pass herself off as a male author with the intention of kind of going undercover to her audience. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, um, George Eliot writes in one of her journal entries that she is receiving a, a, an advance payment for Adam Bede of 800 pounds plus four years of copyright. Now, I'm bringing that up because I don't know what that means. She's getting four years of copyright. 
So I'm throwing that out to, you know, the, uh, the uh, book reading community out there. If anybody knows what the heck that means, please let me know. So let's talk about the plot a little bit. And I'm just going to wing this off on, on memory here because it is, as I said, not a very complicated plot, but there are many, many subplots. And there are many characters, but only really four major characters and, and many, many minor characters. So I'll try to describe the plot by way of the characters. The whole story comes from an incident uh, from George Eliot's aunt. Uh, remember, in a previous video, I discussed George Eliot's aunt, who was a Methodist preacher around the year 1800 in the uh, English Midlands. Well, this incident revolved around her aunt um, staying with a condemned woman in jail until her execution, you know, to a minister to her. What was this jailed woman's crime? The jailed woman's crime was neglecting a, her baby, her newborn baby, until it died of exposure and she was charged with uh, infanticide, murder. Uh, George Eliot takes the story from her aunt and then makes, and then that is the kernel about which Adam Bede, the story, is, is written around. So the character of Dinah Morris then fills the role of George Eliot's aunt. Dinah Morris is a Methodist preacher, roughly the year 1800, who goes through that experience. She has to minister to a young woman who, ha who is condemned to death for the, uh, for the neglect and death of her own baby. Um, who is this character who is condemned to death? Well, in this case, in, in the novel Adam Bede, this character is, uh, is named Hetty Sorrell. Uh, Hetty Sorrell uh, in the novel is, is an annoyance. Uh, she is uh, roughly 16 years old. She is... Um, uh, concerned with only one thing, that's number one, because she is just so damned beautiful uh, that nobody, no man can take uh, their eyes off of her. Everybody's in love with her, and she is incredibly, almost cartoonishly vain. Uh, she only, you know, she looks, at, she stares at herself in the mirror with, with earrings and beautiful ribbons and things like that uh, that she tries on in the middle of the night uh, when nobody's looking, and she'll just kind of gaze at them and wish she had more. Well, how is she going to get more? How is she going to get more of these beautiful little baubles? How is she going to live a life of luxury? Well, the one way she can do it is by marrying the town squire, Arthur Donathorne, Captain Donathorne. Uh, Captain Donathorne is the town squire, a, a landowner. Uh, all, all of these characters, all by the way, are very young. They're all under 30 years old. Captain Donathorne uh, is a landowner, and he can provide the means to, uh, to give Hedy Sorrell a life of luxury. Only one problem. Captain Donathorne uh, is very wealthy. He's the town squire, landowner, etc. Hedy Sorrell, beautiful though she may be, she's a lowly milkmaid. And in this culture, at this time, there is that class distinction that does not allow those two to get together. Now, Arthur Donathorne has got the serious hots for Hetty Sorrell. She's just a knockout, apparently. Uh, so he will indulge his, his, his fantasies, his flirtatious fantasies with her by flirting with her, by giving her gifts, by kissing her, in the grove and holding her hand and giving her uh, goo goo eyes when nobody's looking, you know, and uh, giving her love notes and her lockets with, with pieces of his hair, things like that. But it's always on the sly. Nobody knows because he knows, Arthur Donathorne knows that this is not allowed. He'll never be able to get with Hedy Sorrell. Ultimately, he won't be able to. They are different economic and social classes and that's just the way it is. But, you know, he's got to get his rocks off. So he flirts with her to the extent that he can. Um, and Hedy Sorrell um, is being fooled by this. And she's naive. She's um, uh, the author. Uh, uh, George Eliot argues that she is very naive. And uh, we can't really blame her for being this naive when she's really got only one thing going for her. And that is her looks. 
bad as her looks. Now, every guy that looks at Hetty Sorrell, everybody that sees her is in love with her because she's just so damned hot. And that includes the uh, title character of the book, Adam Bede. That's the character of Adam Bede. Adam Bede, he's a, a carpenter. Very big, very strong, very intelligent. Um, uh, goes through the effort to educate himself. Um, by the end of the book, he's managing property for Arthur Donathorne. Uh, so he, he's, he's, a, he's a very, you know, industrious person. But wow, his weakness is that beautiful woman, Hetty Sorrell, and he wants to marry her. So he discovers Arthur Donathorne and Hetty Sorrell kissing in the grove one day. And so uh, uh, Adam Bede confronts Arthur Donathorne, says, Hey, you can't get with Hetty Sorrell. You know that you're tricking her. You know you can't ultimately marry her. I want to marry her. And then Adam Bede beats the crap out of Arthur Donathorne. Arthur Donathorne then writes a breakup letter to Hetty Sorrell and splits town. Uh, he, uh, <laughs> he gets out of there as fast as he can. Well, it turns out a few months later, you know, eight months later, it turns out Hetty Sorrell is, is, um, is engaged to Adam Bede, but she doesn't want Adam Bede because he knows, she knows a carpenter is not going to give her a life of luxury. It's just not going to happen. So whenever they hold each other and kiss, she secretly wishes it was really Arthur Donathorne, the wealthy squire. Well, she can't take it anymore. She runs off to, uh, runs out of town to find Arthur Donathorne, but what does a simple country milkmaid know about traveling five miles out of town without getting lost and uh, hungry and and destitute and doesn't know where to go and you know she doesn't go far it doesn't take much and then she's gone and then what do you know the shocker of the story book five comes around what do you know she lands in prison Hetty Sorrell lands in prison Adam Bede gets wind of it and finds out that she has had a child and has and she was terrified. Uh, she's only 16, 17 years old and the child dies of exposure and she's condemned to be hung in the morning. And then comes Dinah Morris to stay with her until the morning of the execution. At which time our hero, Arthur Donathorne, rushes back into town with a, um, a hard-won pardon. However, it's not a full pardon. She must be banished from the country as an exile. And that's pretty much the end of the story. So, uh, what have I got to say about this? Now, that's, that's the plot. As I said, a lot of Adam Bede is not plot-driven. Much of this book is, is, uh, is, is, character based so you get to know these characters very uh very deeply um a lot of this story is um is is descriptive so there are large sections as i said that are nothing but descriptions by the way uh i can't help but notice for any uh music fans out there uh as a side note i can't help but think that the song by jethro tull called velvet green recorded in 1976, almost certainly must be based on the novel Adam Bede. Uh, for those of you who know what I'm talking about, uh, give me a thumbs up. <laughs> for those of you who uh, are interested, I'll leave a link to a performance of that song below. Check it out, look at the lyrics, and tell me what you think. Uh, so rock musicians from the 70s were certainly reading their George Eliot. <laughs> um, a few things about this plot. It does not translate well, in my opinion, to the modern world. There is no way that this story could take place in 2018. Um, this is a product of its time. Uh, the class distinctions, uh, the, uh, the, the descriptions of the, the, the carpenters, the milkmaids, you know, the, that sort of thing. But then also just the idea that the outside world, outside of this little town that everybody's engaged in, is, is unknown. It's, a, it's like a vast ocean beyond the limits of the town that nobody is aware of. 
um, communication from one town to the next literally takes weeks to travel. It's, it's pretty interesting when the novel forces you to slow down, slow your pace down, uh, because things happened very slowly in those days. Um, uh, also, there was a large emphasis on superstitions and omens. The character of Adam Bede, uh, there's a scene early in the story where Adam Bede's father dies. Um, uh, this is preceded by omens, weird uh, sounds in the middle of the night, and Adam Bede says, oh, something bad's about to happen. And then what do you know? They found, they found uh, their father dead in a, in a swamp, in a, in a ditch somewhere. Um, uh, as I said, all the characters live and die in the same place. So this is, a, this is a story that I don't think could possibly take place today, which is probably why I've, I, I'm not aware of any, any dramatization of Adam Bede. Uh, uh, I'm not aware that it's ever been filmed. And rightly so. I can't imagine this would make a good movie. I can't imagine it. It's a product of his time and also... It's, as I said, it's not a particularly plot-driven story. Um, George Eliot preserved a lot of good stuff from her short stories from Scenes of Clerical Life that she incorporated into Adam Bede. And a lot of the stuff that I criticized from Scenes of Clerical Life, she dropped. Uh, so she's learning as she's going. Again, she's still an inexperienced writer, and she's still trying to find her style. Um, uh, she gives high quality descriptions of everything. Too many examples to give in this story. Um, almost every page is very detailed description. I call it cinematic. It's described in a way where, remember, this story was written, this book was written before movies. Uh, there were theatrical productions, but movies didn't exist, so people didn't see these things by and large with their eyes. When there's, they're, they're not seeing stories. It's all oral. It's all written. So the descriptions have to be very thorough. Uh, you have to see things with your mind's eye because you're not going to see it on a movie screen. Uh, George Eliot is a master of description. I, you can think of a exercise, a writing exercise, just a routine day, a routine experience that you and I are engaged in, going to the grocery store, going to the bus stop, um, visiting a friend, routine things, write uh, 1,000 words on that experience in as descriptive a manner as you can. You've got George Eliot right there. Um, uh, and, and you have to do it well, by the way. You have to do it in an engaging manner. Um, George Eliot maintains dis uh, many essays within the story, um, sometimes for good, sometimes for ill. What she'll do is she did this many times in Scenes of Clerical Life, where the characters are doing things that may not fit the expectations of that day. Remember that a lot of the novels in the Victorian era are, you know, the heroes are always wealthy, are always pious, never make mistakes. The women are super beautiful, etc. Everything is kind of idealized. And George Eliot breaks that rule over and over and over. Uh, she, she, she talks about how she enjoys writing about ugly people, about flawed people. Uh, she, she writes uh, that right in her book in these little mini essays. She's got whole chapters devoted to describing, explaining to the reader why she is writing about flawed, ugly people the way she is. Why? She loves them the way they are. She wants to be realistic with people and meet them where they're at because that's how she loves people. That's how she enjoys writing about them. So... Um, so she, she, she continues with that. She carries that over from scenes of clerical life. Some things that she drops are the flashbacks. Remember, scenes of clerical life had a lot of flashback scenes you know, where, where a character has a scene where they're reminiscing about days uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the past. Those are gone. Adam Bede contains none of those 
thank God, uh, they were horrible. Um, another bad quality that she has in Adam B that really annoyed me was a weak character for a love interest. She did this a couple of times in Scenes of Clerical Life, and she does this in Adam B. Hedy Sorrell is, when I talked about the descriptions of the characters, uh, Dinah Morris is the central character of the story. I think the novel should not have been called Adam B. I think it should have been called Dinah Morris. She is the kernel of the story. Remember, that's who it, it's modeled after her aunt, after all. She got the kernel of the story from an incident in her childhood. So Dinah Morris is really the central character, and she is described very well. Um, you really get an idea of who this person is. You get an idea that George Eliot, in her youth, went to a lot, a lot of religious tent uh, revival preacher meetings uh, when she was young. Because the descriptions are those, it's like I can see everything, the, the tent, the sawdust, the preaching, the, the emotions, the people crying. Uh, she goes into great detail with the character of Dinah Morris and her compassion uh, with her Methodism uh, to an extent that I can just see everything in front of me. Um, same thing goes with Adam Bede, very well described. A lot of the minor characters um, also that I haven't discussed. There are many minor characters that are given distinct personalities. Very well written. Again, the exception to all of this is the weak love interest that George Eliot really has a problem with, and that's Hedy Sorrell. She is unrealistic. She's cartoonish in her narcissism. She's, um, I can't imagine any guy, she must have been the most gorgeous girl on the planet for any guy to, uh, to be in love with her. Uh, 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 <laughs> you know, every guy was in love with her in this story, as, as annoying as she was. Um, and that is a trait in other stories that she has written. Um, and also a very weak ending. So book five of Adam Bede uh, is the climax of the story. And from what I, what I understand, book five was written very quickly with almost no edits. George Eliot is just, you know, that's the kernel of the story is where uh, Dinah Morris is staying with the condemned Hedy Sorrell uh, until her execution. And that portion of the story is absolutely gripping. And it, can, and it shows that this is the central part. This is what she wants to write about. The next book, book six, which is the final book. Wow, what a let down. Uh, <laughs> George Eliot has, if she's got a problem, it's weak love interest characters and it's very bad endings. Uh, she's committed this crime in some of her stories and scenes of clerical life, and boy does she do it in Adam Bede. Hi folks, sorry, uh, quick edit here. It's uh, uh, getting a little dark outside and I wanna finish this video uh, while I'm here. So I was at the very weak ending of the story, which really let me down because the first five books of Adam Bede, even though the plot is not episodic, uh, it's not like action packed or, or full of intrigue or anything like that. It nonetheless was so well written. The characters were so fleshed out, uh, and the descriptions were so, as I say, cinematic that it, I found it gripping. I loved it. And I wanted to see how the characters after this huge climax of book five, I wanted to see how they're going to develop. Because that's another great thing about George Eliot. The characters do not remain static. They change through the course of the book. They, they learn from their experiences, things like that. So I wanted to see what the characters, how, how, how they're going to change by this huge climax of, a, of, a, of having this, this unwanted baby and barely missing an execution by the, by the authorities. How, 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 how are they going to react to this? What a letdown. What a letdown. All I can say is that book six, by the time we get to book six, we learn that, one, uh, Adam Bede has become more compassionate. Uh, he's not going to, you know, beat the crap out of Arthur Donathorn again. He'll forgive him. 
uh, even after, uh, you know, he has obviously uh, 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 taken advantage and raped uh, young Hedy Sorrell, uh, he'll forgive him. What happens with Hedy Sorrell? This is the major disappointment of the story. What happens with Hedy Sorrell? No idea. We learn in an offhand way, in a way that was so suppressed that I didn't really catch it at first. I had to read the, the relevant paragraph a couple of times before I finally got it. Oh, Hetty Sorrell has been exiled. She's no, There's a reason why nobody's talking about her in the final book, in book six, because she's no longer in England. Uh, she went to, I don't know, it doesn't say. Uh, she went to a penal colony in Australia, maybe? I don't know. Um, and she eventually dies there off camera. It doesn't describe it. It's just one of the characters says, you know, I think it was Arthur Donathorn got news that, uh, oh, Hedy Sorrell has died. <laughs> okay, Sarah, Sarah. <laughs> um, uh, what a terrible way to end the story. I mean, in a lot of ways, George Eliot is painting Hedy Sorrell as a victim. She's a victim of her own one, her own beauty, but her own ignorance. She's just a poor country milkmaid, a, a hick. And the only way she can get through life, the only way she has power is through her beauty. And she knows how to use it. And she knows how to gain power. Has, has she learned anything through this experience? Surely she must have changed after having been raped, after having a baby, after having, you know, being on death row. Um, uh, she apparently, after Dinah Moore stayed with her the night of the execution, uh, she confessed all. She cried and apparently repented. That signals a change in life right there. Uh, you know, but that's never, if that happens, that's never described to us. I would love to know. But in my opinion, George Eliot cops out. That is too huge a topic for her to deal with. So what does she do? pulls her off camera, throws her in a penal colony, and we never hear from her again. She just dies. How does she die? Don't know. <laughs> she just dies. End of story. And and let's throw a happy ending in there. And for no reason whatsoever, let's get Adam Bede to marry Dinah Morris. Out of left field. I mean, these two characters, you know, talk about no chemistry between those two. There's so many directions that George Eliot could have taken this. I mean, an, another direction she could have taken this was a discussion of what virtue is. Adam Bede and Arthur Donathorne are smitten with Hedy Sorrell. Why? Because of her beauty. And they're always talking about how, how kind she is and how good she is and how virtuous she is, etc. But really, when you stand back, what, is she, what does Hedy Sorrell do? to deserve these, these, uh, these, these compliments of, of kindness or these descriptions of being virtuous. What does she do to deserve that? Not a damned thing. She does nothing that is kind. She's got a young cousin, you know, a toddler named uh, Toddy, who she's trying to brush away all the time. She doesn't like her. She's only after number one. She only dreams about living a life of luxury. She only wants to hang out with the rich guy because the rich guy can afford to give her the life she wants. She 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 uh, she actively flirts when other women are around, and she knows other women are around, so she'll out flirt them, uh, and she does this intentionally. Etc. Why is well, why is Hedy Sorrell described by Adam Bede as being kind and virtuous? No reason at all, and and that is never addressed by George Eliot. What a ripe topic to discuss! Uh, what a ripe topic to frame a narrative around, and she just totally misses it, doesn't see it. Um, she, again, George Eliot could have gone in many directions, but she ends the story kills off the main focal point character of the story, the main catalyst of this story, kills her off, and then has a happy ending with this non sequitur marriage. Very disappointing. Very disappointing. And also, what about Captain Donathorne? We never hear about how he changed. He's the ultimate uh, um, uh, perpetrator of this crime. 
Uh, he just lives life. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, he comes back into town after Hedy Sorrell is uh, sent off to a penal colony. And um, it's like nobody's the wiser. Nobody says anything to him. Uh, it's like just life goes on. Hey, you know, <laughs> did, did they, could they have a Me Too movement or something? <laughs> anything? <laughs> Ultimately, very disappointing. Very disappointing. Um, so, again, Adam Bede, I enjoyed the first few chapters, but sh George Eliot, at this time in her career, as evidenced by Adam Bede and uh, Scenes of Clerical Life, has two major problems. Weak female love interest and very bad endings. She doesn't know how to end a story. So, we'll just leave it at that. Uh, I'm... I'm I, of course, recommend Adam Bede for everybody and come to your own decisions. And I'd love to hear what you think of the story. Oh, there's people shooting down there. Awesome. So until next time, you guys take care.